Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Eric High, Assistant Professor of Music at St. Norbert College. We'll discuss how the teaching of music has changed in higher education, and we'll also discuss the evolution of jazz music. High has been at St. Norbert College since 2005. Prior to his appointment at St. Norbert, he taught at public school in Arizona for five years. Since moving to Wisconsin, he has performed with the Green Bay Symphony Orchestra, the Fox Valley Symphony Orchestra, and the Brass Circle Quintet. He has been featured as a soloist with the St. Norbert College Community Band, the NEW Concert Band, and the Lakeshore Wind Ensemble. Eric teaches low brass, brass ensembles, jazz ensemble, evolution of jazz, and music appreciation at St. Norbert. Eric, welcome to the program. Thank you, Kevin. Well, let's talk about jazz first, because obviously that's a, that's a love that you have. Sure. And while I'm guessing that most folks who are watching have some idea about what it is, from a musical point of view, what's jazz? Well, jazz is an uh, American uh, form of music uh, that really started out uh, uh, quite organically and naturally um, uh, as, as entertainment music, as music for dancing, as, as, as that sort of stuff. Uh, later on, it evolved into more of an artistic, uh, 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 almost American classical music sort of uh, form of music. But um, generally, it, it, uh, one of the key elements is improvisation. You have to have uh, uh, instrumentalists and singers and the like that um, can improvise and, and produce music uh, that is uh, pleasant, uh, uh, ideally, I suppose, um, on the spot, you know, uh, within given um, uh, rules and, and structures and, and harmonies and things like that. But it's really uh, sort of a spontaneous uh, creation that, that is unlike just about any other type of music. You say it's an American classical music form. Um, so it was born here in the U.S. Yeah. Where did it come from? Uh, well, it came really from all different sorts of places. Uh, it, it was the sort of, when I'm teaching it, I, I usually tell students that it's, this, it's the type of music that only could have happened here in the United States because of you know, what we learned in grade school, that America is this great melting pot and, and all of these immigrants and all these people that came to this country either willingly or uh, in the case of jazz, a lot of, uh, against their will. Um, uh, particularly African American uh, uh, and, the, and their elements that they brought with them um, from different parts of the world. Um, but what you have is uh, all of this sort of stuff mixed up, um, uh, African American spirituals, you have uh, the blues, you have uh, military bands and horn music and that sort of stuff. You have American popular songs from the middle of the 19th century, all that kind of stuff sort of mixed up and uh, was manipulated in certain ways and was kind of spit out the other end and eventually we got jazz. And it, um, most of that sort of happened, uh, experts tend to agree, it typically happened around New Orleans um, uh, because New Orleans was the biggest city in the southern United States um, halfway through the 19th century. It had all of these people, it had all of these elements, it had everything there. Um, and so uh, with uh, a city that large and with the need for entertainment and, and music and things of that nature, jazz is really what sort of developed there. It, it sounds sort of like a natural thing that would have happened, um, mostly because you have a bunch of folks who know something about music, right? And especially in a melting pot, pot like New Orleans, somebody starts playing something, somebody starts riffing off of that. I, I mean, I can see how that would how that would occur. I mean, it seems quite natural, almost like blues is, yeah, very is a much. natural thing. And to me, blues is sort of a form of jazz, but maybe you feel differently about that. Well, uh, I, I think uh, that's a safe assumption. Um, uh, the, the form of the blues, the blues uh, is a certain type of African-American derived music. Uh, it has a particular structure and a particular form to it and particular like chords and harmonies. And it is very popular uh, uh, within jazz and is often used by jazz musicians and uh, we could consider it perhaps a launching point for jazz music to, to, to start with the blues and then it slowly perhaps gets a little more advanced and incorporates other elements uh, from American popular song or, or, or things of that nature, marches and, and things of that uh, sort of stuff. But I think you're exactly right. Blues plays a big role in it and, 
and the, f the freeness of it and the ability for people to just kind of make things up on the spot or, or organically change things or to have a dialogue uh, with other instrumentalists. The clarinet player plays something like this and the trumpet player answers them and, and all of that happens spontaneously in the moment and that's really what makes the music what it is. The thing that impresses me about all that is the, the command of music theory that I suspect a lot of jazz musicians have is towering because you know blues is sort of like the the, the simpler version of that to me mm -hmm. you know I play a little guitar but I'm certainly not a musician by any stretch of the imagination when I watch these folks you know venture into chord structures that just seem to me you know that's the 11th augment into the third power and mm -hmm. things and things like that and and realizing that there's four people around them that are kind of picking up on that and playing through it is is to me, the real beauty of watching jazz being performed. I think you're right. On the highest level, uh, the the ability to, for musicians to communicate with each other um, and 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 uh, to to understand the uh, it's in most advanced levels the degree of harmony which you're talking about, uh, which can be very complex, um, and to even imply certain chords, uh, even if it's not understood on paper, uh, some musicians can actually. Um, uh, can allude to a chord as they play and then the next time uh, through the form um, if everybody's listening they will kind of understand what's coming and they can make subtle changes to to adapt to that yeah it's it's amazing when it goes bad it goes spectacularly bad too <laughs> exactly you, you really uh, you can tell when it's being done very very well and uh, it, it, it it can not go very well if people aren't prepared for it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I also find interesting about about jazz is it seems like it's impossible to pull apart, um, you know, the history of race in the U.S. Uh, or how how do you separate that from the music and the development of the music? It just seems to me it's it's organic to that. I think you're right. They 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 are intertwined to a point where you can't really uh, you can't handle them separately. You know, um, so much of the music uh, is involved in um, segregation or, or uh, uh, y you know, the, the whole rise of the civil rights movement in the uh, late 50s and the, six and the early 60s, um, the desegregation of schools um, and uh, the musicians' responses to uh, what was happening in the country at that time. And then generationally, within the jazz movement, you get um, a lot of uh, uh, different characters and different musicians that really reflect the sign of the times. Miles Davis and Louis Armstrong both played the trumpet, uh, but Miles Davis was of a generation that was much more empowered and uh, uh, things of that nature. So he, he could behave differently, he could act differently, he could play different music. Uh, Louis Armstrong was from an earlier generation and was uh, uh, arguably one of the greatest uh, jazz musicians there was. Um, and, and he was outspoken uh, when, when the time came, but he was uh, for a while criticized uh, by some of the younger generation of musicians for, for kind of going along with the status quo, mm -hmm. for example. It, you know, to me it's very similar to the situation between Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali, where Joe Lewis, uh, you know, was in, in a certain era and the expectations of him as a black athlete were very different than uh, the expectations of Muhammad Ali. Each pushed the envelope in, in their own way, but what was possible for Ali was not possible for, for Joe Lewis. And it strikes me as kind of being the same thing. I think that's a very good analysis. You know, one of the other things I find kind of interesting is going back to the generation before the 1920s. It seems to me that that's when um, jazz crossed over in a sense, that as opposed to being an exclusively or nearly exclusively African-American form that you know white people were beginning to pay attention to it and and uh, and uh, during the war and with the swing and all that mm -hmm. they, they kind of took their own take on it um, my sense is that there was a general sense of, uh, you know of course the 20s were a booming time mm -hmm. and with prohibition there was a general sense of lawlessness pushing pushing the envelope among young people um, to, do you think that that's what happened and and how do you think that particularly influenced uh, music later on? Uh, well, I think I agree with you completely. Um, uh, during the late teens, perhaps, is when jazz really started to become more of a mainstream art form. And I, and I like to point out that a lot of that is generational. 
th there was a time in your life where you started listening to music that wasn't your parents' music. Mm -hmm. and, and everybody has that moment. And, and there's something, you know, liberating about it. There's something, there's something uh, you have a sense of ownership. This is mine. This is my identity is, is tied up in this and, and, and not anybody else's. Or your peers, for example, but not any other, uh, not an older generation or, or things of that nature. Um, and and I, I, I really believe that that kind of happened to jazz in the late teens. Um, it became, uh, with, with the rise of ragtime music and, and highly syncopated uh, organized dance music and things like that, um, an older generation that was a little more um, uh, romanticized, uh, American popular song-ish, uh, may perhaps may have been a little leery of this new, fast, highly syncopated uh, music, whereas the next generation welcomed it with open arms, and then uh, the ripple effect, you know, it, it just snowballed from, the, from that point. And then you get into the 1930s, where you have 70-some-odd uh, percent of all popular music is, is big band or dance band oriented, and there's white bands, and there's black bands, and, and uh, uh, perhaps ironically, the vast majority of the most popular bands with the most popular tunes on the hit parade were actually at that point were white bands. Um, but there were still great African-American bands, Count Basie and Duke Ellington and uh, Fletcher Henderson's group and lots of, lots of other groups like that still doing it. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's very tied to kind of generational um, shifts and, and, and the, the race element is inescapable. Well, you know, also the, the rise of popular culture uh, or I should say, the change in popular culture. You had radio, you had movies, uh, maybe greater availability of, uh, of magazines, et cetera, clearly had an effect. I mean, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you didn't have to go to the local club to hear music. Exactly. You could get you know, a recording of it, or you could watch it in a movie. You know, we might kind of make fun of uh, the stiffness with which the first talkies kind of did their version of music videos, but still, I mean, it's, it's amazing that that became democratized mm -hmm. in, a, in a sense. Um, I'm curious, what, who are your favorite jazz musicians? Who have been the big influences upon you? Uh, wow. Um, I think it changes uh, often. Uh, yeah, yeah. I teach a jazz history course every spring, and I, I, I kind of ebb and flow throughout the course of the class as I lead students through new uh, things. Um, I'm a trombone player, so uh, uh, there's a number of trombone players that I uh, like just by default, J.J. Uh, Johnson or Curtis Fuller is a personal favorite of mine. Um, uh, other instruments, um, I was always a big fan of Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. Um, Art Blakey's a, drum pl uh, a drummer and um, his groups were always exceptional. Uh, as I get older, um, uh, I'm drawn to the music of John Coltrane quite a bit. Uh, as a younger musician, um, people would always say, oh, you gotta listen to a lot of John Coltrane and this and that, and it's really kind of heavy stuff, and, and it is. Um, it kind of takes a while to, uh, to, to reach out and, 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 and have that music grow on you. Um, of course, Miles Davis. Uh, but then, you know, uh, I can appreciate um, uh, earlier forms of jazz more and more too, uh, particularly the likes of Louis Armstrong um, and bebop, which uh, I had a, had a difficult time uh, grabbing onto the likes of Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker as a younger musician, just f uh, for the the amount of information that that the musicians from the bebop school give you, the speed and the the dexterity and the virtuosity, um, uh, and now as I've lived with it more and more, it grows on you more, and and I have much more appreciation for it. Yeah, I was as you were saying, I was thinking about some very early like Popeye cartoons and and of that era, and they jazz can be. Highly featured in there, which is oh, sure. which is interesting. But that was kind of experimental uh, for the time. Well, let's talk a little bit about you and where you grew up and how you got here. So, where did you grow up? Uh, I am actually from uh, Duluth, Minnesota, okay. uh, the Great North Woods. Right. Um, uh, I, I was born and raised there. Um, I actually started playing the guitar when I was four. Mm. Um, my mother said I had a lot of energy and it needed to be directed. Uh, so uh, they actually got me guitar lessons. My older sister was playing the piano, so they, uh, I wanted to do something different. Um, uh, I actually was blessed with uh, the finest guitar teacher a four-year-old could ever have. And uh, it was, she was actually a nun. Her name was Sister Henrietta. 
and uh, she lived and uh, taught at the College of St. Scholastica. So for eight years of my very young life, I went to St. Scholastica um, once a week to take uh, guitar lessons. And um, uh, that kind of uh, put me on the path uh, to where I am now. Um, I was always influenced by, uh, you know, you're influenced by the music of, uh, of people you admire and, and, and other things that are happening. So. Uh, my father would always play Doobie Brothers records, uh, so I was, I've always been a big like, Doobie Brothers fan. Uh, the older kids in my neighborhood, this was 1979, you know, 1978, 1979, Kiss was very big. So, uh, it was as a, as a, for It all was, of us. it was, but uh, looking back, it was also sort of glorious, you know. So as a young kid playing the guitar, um, things like that sort of drove me. Uh, uh, that way and then um, I was actually drawn to the trombone um, because I would go to hockey games um, at the University of Minnesota Duluth and you'd watch the pet band and because the trombone slides extend so far uh, they would sit in the front of the pet band right up against the plexiglass and I thought those were the best seats so I thought, I'll play the trombone <laughs> so I can have such great seats at the hockey game. And, uh, and then um, the rest is pretty much history. From that point, I, uh, uh, I graduated from uh, UW-Superior and um, uh, moved to Arizona to go to graduate school at Arizona State. Don't blame you. Uh, I needed a break <laughs> from winter for a while, um, so I spent eight uh, years or so in the desert um, got my master's degree and my DMA, and uh, made a lot of good friends and met my wife, and uh, and then we came back here. Is there a time where you remember that you realize, wow, I actually am really better at this than all these other folks? I mean, is there a moment where you said, oh my gosh, I really have talent? Um, I don't know if that's the case. I uh, there's always very good people. Every, in every, uh, playing every instrument somewhere. There's always somebody who can do something better than you can, and it keeps you moving forward, I suppose. Um, I do remember distinctly bringing my guitar to kindergarten and playing, and uh, I, it's embarrassing, but I enjoyed the amount of attention I, attention I received. Um, uh, as a performer, you're, ideally you want to please the people that are listening, and you, and you, you kind of want to uh, perhaps earn their respect. Um, and I remember uh, uh, my five-year-old friends uh, kind of thinking that was a big deal and perhaps that uh, stuck with me subconsciously. I'm guessing you're not the first person to pick up a guitar and enjoy the attention that, uh, that, that comes it, with it. It certainly <laughs> has uh, 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 a, a picture is painted there, yes. Yes. So um, obviously a doctoral program in music is is a little different than being an archaeologist <laughs> or being a chemist or being an economist. So wh what do you do? I mean, what kind of original research are you expected to do? What does the course work like? Well, uh, just like uh, economists or, or other areas, there are different specialties and there's different things. Um, there, there are PhD programs uh, like music education or music theory or, or music history, musicologists, things of that nature. Um, my degree is actually a DMA, which is a Doctorate of Musical Arts, which is more of a performance degree. Um, you, you prove that you are a, uh, a, a high caliber performer and you, and you do all the research associate, associated with that sort of work. So uh, for me, um, uh, uh, I guess the best way to put it is a lot of my research goes into um, uh, music, uh, the performance of music, the studying of music, um, the presentation of music. Um, I will give, uh, me and my colleagues here at the college, we will give uh, re oftentimes recitals, um, we'll give other programs uh, uh, as, as groups. Um, or our student-led groups or faculty groups or things of that nature. But there's a lot of uh, work that goes into um, uh, molding a program so uh, it kind of, we can steer people in the direction that we want to go. Um, uh, the research behind the composers, uh, what was the intention of the music, um, what's the best presentation of the music, things of that nature. Um, uh, my, my level of research or, or my research for my doctoral document was actually a historical um, document on a particular instrument 
um, and how it is used and when it is used and what music it is used for and what direction that, that instrument is going in now and things of that nature. So there's somebody someplace that got a thesis done in the spit valve probably, right? Uh, it's, it's, it is possible, <laughs> yeah. Uh, why it's placed where it is and, and uh, different forms of it, I suppose. Yeah, I, uh, I'm sure there is. I, there's, in economics, there are things far more arcane than that <laughs> that they give doctors for. Um, so here at St. Norbert, you've been here for uh, getting close to a decade now. Uh, what, what courses do you teach? Uh, well, um, pretty much uh, uh, I teach a, a jazz history course, um, Evolution of Jazz. I also uh, created a American popular history course, American popular music course, um, the history of American popular music. Uh, which we started about four years ago, and uh, uh, students seem to like. It's usually uh, popular. I know that. That's we can't, good. Well, thank you. <laughs> there are there are way more people that want to take it than there are uh, seats in the class. Well, that's not. That's it's always nice uh, to for people to to share an interest, I suppose. And it's it's kind of uh, it's, it's a little bit easier of a sell to to uh, eighteen to twenty two year olds than <laughs> a lot of other classes. Here, write this. Uh, admittedly, exactly. <laughs> Um, I run the Jazz Ensemble, so uh, we, uh, the Jazz Ensemble does a lot of work, um, lots of concerts, three big concerts every semester. Um, I teach low brass lessons, so trombones and euphoniums and tubas. Uh, we often have brass chamber music, which is, which is small groups of brass playing things like uh, playing together, specific brass music. Um, in the past, I've uh, done one of the larger bands. Um, I have taught a music appreciation course every once in a while, things like that. Now, you obviously have very, two very different populations to which you're trying to teach. There are the students who want to go on in music that are majoring in music or minoring in music, and then there's non-musicians. And as somebody who teaches you know, <laughs> you know, other kinds of academic classes, um, okay, either you kind of have the intellectual ability to take this course or you don't. I suppose that's a form of talent. But I think you ha that musicians, when they teach, have to be a little bit more forgiving of complete lack of talent than perhaps other areas are. How do you deal with that? I mean, how, clearly some people can do it and others just can't. H how do you deal with that in a course uh, like a, a history or, or just basic lessons? Sure. Well, I think everybody can do it on some level, but, but that level can vary pretty widely. Um, uh, the, the jazz history course and the American popular music history course are, are survey courses. So um, th there doesn't have to be a tremendous amount of uh, musical skill um, for any of the students involved. Um, I just, uh, the first day of class I always ask them, tell me what your musical experience is. And it could be, you know, I took a year of piano lessons when I was six or I've, I've been doing something for 15 years or whatever, you, you kind of get uh, wow. everybody all the way across the board. Um, and uh, I, I ask them and I tell them that comes into play as far as terminology we, we might throw around in class or an understanding of, uh, of forms or, or melodies and harmonies and, and instruments, uh, things of that nature. It might be easier for some people to recognize certain timbres and sounds that, that someone who has less experience um, but luckily, those uh, survey type courses, it doesn't require um, uh, any level of virtuosity to, to come in and, and just learn about uh, uh, the overarching view or overarching sort of um, uh, path that, that popular music or jazz has taken over the last you know, two centuries. Um, on the other hand, uh, with ensembles, with jazz ensemble and our, and our bands and our choirs and, and, and lessons uh, of that nature, uh, obviously we, you have to have a, a pretty solid background um, in playing your instrument. Um, by, by this point, typically, uh, most students have been playing for uh, six or seven years if they start in the sixth grade or something like that. So they've been playing for a while, they, they, they clearly enjoy it. Um, uh, they have a passion for it, they want to share it with other people. So that also helps considerably when, when students love it as much as they do, um, or, or it's just part of their you know, lives that much, it, it becomes a little bit easier to uh, uh, share with them and, and, and help them grow as musicians. Yeah, we don't get as much of that in economics. I, I'm actually amazed at how many students that want to study something else, psychology, math, chemistry, whatever, that, that want to pursue 
their education in music, you know, either any number of instruments, and uh, will make it a point to fit in a music minor mm -hmm. or whatever. And it's a ton of work. I mean, people that want to meet a minor in music have got to really make a commitment to the lessons and all that. Absolutely, but it's it's we we try and be very welcoming. We try and have you know, our being the size of. Uh, liberal arts college that we are, uh, we really de our music department depends on minors and non-majors. We really need all those people who want to continue to play and and and, and want to be a part of it uh, to make it happen. Um, and we're 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 just so blessed with with those types of students. And and um, you know the music is is the sort of thing that lots of people can do and lots of people do. Um, you yourself play the guitar and and um, barely. <laughs> well, don't sell yourself short. I, there's, I'm sure there's plenty of music you sound fantastic on, you know. And um, guitar and piano are some of those instruments where you know you can find. It, it doesn't take too long to find somebody who can play uh, some of those instruments. Um, there is a difference between playing them really well or playing them on on just a level that is good enough for you for enjoyment. There's, there's a, perhaps an intellectual level, like you say, when we're talking about jazz and harmony, um, a lot of guitar players can play a, a G7 chord, but can they play a G7 with a flat nine and a sharp 13? Well, they, they, now we're lost, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, there isn't perhaps an intellectual level there, um, but th the beauty of what we do is for a lot of music that people enjoy and want to be a part of, it's not really required. So they can find music that they love to play, that they like to participate in, that they can work with friends or, or, or colleagues or whatever on. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, that intense. And, and everyone still has an enjoyable time. It's like everything else, right? I mean, you, you got to put in a lot of time before people are willing to actually pay money to see you. Uh, uh, yes, I would, yeah, I would hope so, right, yeah. Well, the good news is that the folks out there don't have to pay any money to, to, to see you do this. And uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to play for us. Well, um, typically, we, uh, most of the music as a trombone player that I play uh, is, is, with a, is with other people, like in an ensemble or, or perhaps with a piano player or things of that nature. Um, but uh, we're, I'm just going to play a little solo uh, movement uh, from a piece. It's actually a uh, piece for tuba, for solo tuba, uh, called The Serenade for Solo Tuba by uh, an American composer by the name of Vincent Persichetti. Uh, it's a it's a short little movement called an arietta, which is a which is essentially a short song, um, but it's it's kind of melodious and lovely and lyrical and kind of expressive. I like playing it, so I thought it'd be fun to play. Well, let's get after it. And uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. <laughs>